going refuge, the Sangha for refuge, and the role of Sangha in trading the path. These are the few topics that we'll go through. We'll go through the historical context and the meaning of Sangha, refuge and Sangha, ref particularly taking refuge in the Sangha, requisites and representation, Sangha roles in the Buddha Sasana, and other things to know about the Sangha. Okay, next slide, please. So, Sangha, the meaning of Sangha actually is an assemblage, a congregation or community historically used in a political context, denote a govern, governing uh, as group in a republic or kingdom. And it has been used by other religious associations, including uh, Jains and Sikhs, other groups also. In Buddhism, Sangha particularly refers to the monastic community of bhikkhus and bhikkhuni. And these communities traditionally refer as bhikkhu Sangha or bhikkhuni Sangha. There is a separate category for those who have uh, attained enlightenment, whether they are members of the uh, monastic or not, and they are called Arya Sangha. Next slide, please. Mahayana practitioners sometimes use the word Sangha for lay people also, but in Theravada Pali Canon, there's another term for the larger community, the term Parisa. So, Normally, the word Sangha in, in uh, Theravada tradition is only used for the Arya Sangha, the ideal, which is the awakened one, or the conventional monks and nuns. Okay? The Sangha was originally established by Gautama or Sakyamuni Buddha in the 5th century, provide a means for those who wish to practice full-time in a very highly disciplined way, free from restrictions and responsibility of the household life. The Sangha also fulfills the function to, to preserve the Buddha's teaching. Okay? They, that means these monastics, the full-time job is to practice. By practicing, it provides the, the function of preserving the, the teaching and also provide the spiritual support for the Buddhist lay community. Um, historically, it is responsible to maintain the integrity of the doctrine, the teachings, and to pass down the teaching of the Buddha. Next slide, please. Um, the Sangha first established when the Buddha met and preached the first sermon to the first five monks who were led by Kondyana. Kondyana, for those who know, was one of the main aesthetics that predicted the uh, destiny the, of the Buddha. And the key feature of the Buddhist monastic uh, life is the adherence to Vinaya. It's a set of conducts which includes a lot of rules uh, called the Patimokha rules, but the main thing is a complete chastity and many, many other uh, rules. Normally for monks, 220, supposedly we have the ideas 227 and nuns 311, but actually that's only the first two books. There are actually five books of rules. And during Buddha's time, a lot of sermons were preached to the monks, so quite often the Buddha address the audience as Bikawe, which is the evocative form of uh, Biku. Okay? And during that time, of course, the audience have enlightened and unenlightened monks. Next slide, please. So for the first 20 years of the Buddha's teaching, there were actually no precepts, no rules at, at all. But there is a list of admonishment called Owada Patimoka. The monks would meet. At first, actually, they don't even meet. But uh, a bit later, when people complain, the monks would meet together during Oposata days, which is uh, full moon and no moon. And then they will recite the Awada Patimoka, which is just three parts only, very simple. No, no specific rules, just follow this Awada Patimoka. The first part is about the aspiration, the, the goal of Buddhism, which is um, here stated in Pali, Kanti Paramang Tapo Titika. Nibanang Paramang Wadanti Buddha, Nahi Pabajito Paru Pagati, Samano Hoti Param Vihe Tayanto. Endurance patience is the highest austere practice. Nibbana is supreme, the Buddha say. So the goal is always about enlightenment, awakening, Nibbana. He verily is not a recluse who harms others, nor he is an ascetic who oppress others. So about not harming other people and practicing 
towards awakening to the reality of life. That, that's the goal ideal. Next slide, please. And the second part is about the, the practice, the principle of practice. The first part is the goal, second is the practice. And this one, I think most Buddhists are familiar. Sabha papasa akaranang kusalasa upasampada sachita pariyoda panang etang budana sasananti. The giving up of all evil, cultivate the good, the cleansing of one's mind. This is the Buddha's teaching. Okay, especially actually the evil is things that block you towards awakening. The good is things that help you, support you towards awakening to the truth. Okay, next slide, please. The third last part deals to with the missionary method of the Buddha. The Buddha pro, pro, promulgated a peaceful way, not forceful one, to propagate the Dharma. There's no force to make people believe. So the last paragraph is Anu Pawado, Anu Pagato, Pati Moke Cha Samwaro, Matanyuta Cha Batasmin, Patancha Sayana Sanam, Adichite Cha Ayogo, Etang Buddhana Sasananti. Not disparaging, not talking bad of other people, not injuring, restraint with the monastic code, okay? moderation in food, dwelling in seclusion, commitment to heightened mind, as in a heightened, a more higher consciousness to awaken to the reality of uh, life. This is the Buddha's teaching. Next slide, please. Actually, for the first 20 years, there is no rules because all the monks were enlightened. So no problem at all. When everyone is enlightened, there's no problem at all. But the first, after the first 20 years, monks starts to do action that were not appropriate for monastic. And how the rules were laid was each time a monk do something inappropriate, the Buddha will formulate a rule. Okay. And in our Vinaya Pitaka, the Tipitaka has three parts, the Sutta, Vinaya, and Abhidhamma. The Vinaya Pitaka Every single rule has an original story why the Buddha formulate the particular rule. Okay? And uh, the person, the particular monk who caused the rule to be formulated doesn't actually break the rule because he did it before the rule was formulated. Okay? I'll give you an example. One of the first rules that's formulated is uh, the first Parajika rule where um, monks who commit any sexual activity will have to disrobe and they cannot ordain anymore. There are four of such rules. This is one of the rules. And the first monk who committed is uh, Venerable Sudina. And what happened actually, he's, uh, before he was ordained, he wanted to ordain, when he wanted to ordain as a monk, the parents were very against because the only son. But after really you know, begging and all that, he managed to basically, uh, without the consent, really you know, the uh, real willingness of the parents he, he managed to get ordained that means uh, unwillingly the parents allow him to ordain after six seven years of ordination he decided to come back when he visit his parents the mother keep crying and says that you don't leave us with the lineage okay he was married before he ordained so because you have no children and you yourself has gone to become a monk the mother keep pleading him to at least give them a a, a grandchildren so out of like the struggle he had a sexual activity with the ex-wife and then produced a, a son so when that happens the devas complain actually the devas also sometimes complain the devas complain and the buddha laid this uh, rule that no sexual activity it is there was no such rule because it's understood not to commit this but uh, he didn't consider he was allowed to remain as a monk because there was no such rule when he committed this act. But interestingly in the story, he couldn't practice after that because of remorse. But his ex-wife, the wife you know, uh, which he left after he got ordained, and the son both became Arha, um, surprisingly. And then um, there's also, interestingly, there's also a group of, uh, we call it Chabaya Bhikkhu, six monks. They go in groups of two, 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 who purposely break, uh, who purposely do something inappropriate, which is not in the rule yet. So a lot of the rules are formulated because of this group of six months. Two will always find rules that the Buddha has not laid, which not things that are not appropriate and they will do it. And then another two is um, they don't care. 
So they are very strange monks during Buddha's time also. Just to give you an idea of uh, why the Vinaya is uh, formulated. Um, a lot also has to do with uh, to uh, address the complaints of lay people. Like the bathing rule is uh, initially Buddha formulated a rule that monks are not allowed to bathe more than once every two weeks. Uh, that's because one time when the king was bathing in the river, the monks came and out of respect, the king allowed the monks to bathe first. But the monks spent a lot of time there, like they're playing or whatever. By the time the king's bathe, it was too late and the city gate closed. So the king has to stay outside and the, the citizens complained. So Buddha laid a rule at that time. From now on, monks can only bathe once every two weeks. But of course, after that, there's a lot of uh, exception. Exception, you know, summer is accepted and traveling is accepted and so on. Just to give you an idea how the rules were formulated. Next slide, please. Okay, to me, why the rules were formulated only when someone break the rule has, this is the possible reason. One, to emphasize the teaching of dependent origination. That means everything happened has a reason, not because Buddha simply lay a rule. And also to show cause and effect. Because of this incident, so Buddha has to lay this rule. And also the third point is, so it, you can't have a, a re irrefutable reason for each and every rule. That means Buddha says, no, because this happened, so this rule has to be followed. Okay, next slide, please. Refuge and why we take refuge in the Triple Gem, especially the Sangha. Next slide, please. Taking refuge actually is uh, to take something as your goal, as something that you aim for, okay? And also something that protects us. Why? Because if you follow the truth, how the world works, you will have a certain amount of protection. For example, if you understand how gravity works and you follow the rules of gravity, then you, you won't walk out of a edge of a tall building or a cliff. So that's following... You know, the truth has its power of protection in this way. Triple gem represents three facets of the reality of life or the truth. Buddha is the form embodiment of the reality of how life works. Buddha is the Dharma in, in the form. So we can at least see someone has definitely accomplished what the understanding of the teaching. Dharma is the formless reality of how life works. It's the Thing that you need to practice to, to become one with how life works. Sangha is the people who, who are practicing to embody the reality of life. So you, you need the Sangha because uh, it gives you an example in front of you, someone that you can, or a group of people that you can learn from. By following, like I said just now, by following the reality of how life works, instead of holding to our illusion or delusion, we will be protected from endless suffering. Okay, One of the uh, example I want to give, which I keep sharing in my uh, Friday's Dharma sharing, is that a lot of us think that we experience what is happening to us, but we don't. We experience what we think is happening to us, and that makes a lot of difference. So if you can break through this illusion of thinking that you really experience the world, you will solve a lot of uh, your difficulties and suffering in the world. So Again, Buddha is the form embodiment, a model for us to follow. Dharma is the guide, the law that guides us to practice. And Sangha is the people who are practicing to give us support. Next slide, please. To take refuge in the Sangha is to uh, take refuge in the beings who are dedicated to practicing the path to enlightenment or awakening. It provides a powerful guide because there's someone who guide you and also it provides you the inspiration and motivation that there are people who are still doing this. It also provides uh, as a spiritual, good spiritual friend since the Buddha is no longer around. Um, it's a, it also reminds us of the theme of renunciation in the teachings of the Buddha. The, the theme of renunciation is very important. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, normally, in the text, when you in the Dajaka Parita and the uh, Dhammapada 188 and 192, the Buddha encourages to take refuge in the Sangha. When they say this Sangha, normally is uh, the Arya Sangha. 
okay? Because it's an infinite field of merits. Normally, why I say uh, it refers to the Arya Sangha, because uh, when you recite the qualities of the Sangha, the Supatipano uh, and so on, you have this Yadidam Chatari Yugani, Atta Purisa Pugala, the four pairs and eight individuals. Okay, that refers to the four pairs of uh, uh, first stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage of uh, sainthood. So when we take refuge in uh, Sangha, normally refer to Arya Sangha. Okay, when we collect the qualities of Triple Jump, we are encouraged to emulate these qualities. Is taking part of refuge to embody the qualities. Remember, it's not a, uh, it's a practice, not a de devotion. Practice to embody these qualities. Um, the conventional Sangha is, will provide only with people practicing, then only you have the Arya Sangha. Okay, next slide, please. Requisites and representations of the requisites, the, the things used by the monks. Next slide. So the ropes, like I say just now, the ropes wear by the monks important uh, symbol of the monastic code, uh, of the mon monastic Sangha, and it's the symbol of renunciation. Okay, on a side note, which I forgot to share with you, nowadays in the Western world, quite often they use the word Sangha as uh, people who are practicing together, including the lay people. This is a uh, Westerner usually uh, use this because Westerner likes you know, the idea of equality and so on. So when they use the words, the term Sangha is like uh, people who practice together. Okay, um, this next point is very important. Uh, I feel that when you are paying respect or offering any anything to the monastic uh, sangha with monks and nuns thing that you are offering to a representative of the buddha and sangha of the past present and future okay this is much more meritorious rather than you're offering to one single individual uh, monk or nun okay and also you will not be disappointed if that particular monk and nun later on did something that annoys you or later the monk or nun disrobe you won't have regret okay actually once you're offered your merits already there, you don't need to uh, worry that you no, know, my merits is gone, whatever the monks or nuns done. But just in case, when you offer, please think that you're offering to Buddha and the Sangha of past, present, and future. Next slide, please. Okay. The team renunciation, to me, renunciation does not mean becoming a monk or nun. Okay. It just means that you are able to let go of things, people, ideas, opinions, and beliefs, especially your opinions and beliefs. In order for us to awaken to the reality of life, we have to be able to let go, to renounce our opinions and beliefs. Otherwise, we were stuck because our opinions, beliefs, background tainted our vision of reality. We only see a small part of reality being influenced and brainwashed by our opinions background but we think that's the truth so you must be able to renounce that and monastic sangha um, is a model for that okay so renunciation is very important quality in the path towards awakening if we don't be able to let go of our things people ideas opinions and beliefs we will stuck in the cycle of birth and death okay and although definitely to me is uh, lay people I know many lay people who can practice renunciation in lay life. Renunciation doesn't mean give away everything. Okay, People sometimes have this wrong idea, Buddhists must give away every single thing they have. No. Renunciation means that you, you can have whatever you have, but when the thing is lost or damaged, you, you don't go into grief and sorrow forever. So that's able to take up and let go. That's the real renunciation not just throw away, give away everything, okay? So, okay, the monastic sangha provides a, a role model because uh, monastic sangha leaves everything behind to basically uh, for the practice. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the three, uh, the requisites of the monk, besides the three ropes, actually monks uh, usually have three ropes, upper, lower, and a uh, double rope for coal. Okay, but there's also uh, five other items. Usually the ropes represent uh, a, renunci uh, a renunciation, so we represent renunciation. There are five other items, the uh, arms bow, okay, the razor for shaving. When a person gets ordained, they must have these eight items. Okay, razor for shaving, this is also a symbol of renunciation. 
a needle for sewing. Um, this one is not in the text, but to me, it's one of the reasons is to train the monk to be, have an individual effort for maintaining themselves. Okay? Water strainer, um, to me, it could be a symbol of harmlessness because every time when we drink out, in the old days, when we drink from the stream, you have to sieve through first so that you, you don't drink any uh, beings, uh, small insects or whatever together with you. Belt is when monks go out. In the monastery, they don't need to wear the belt. When they go out, they need to wear a belt. It also makes guests remind us to be more heedful when you have to interact with uh, other people when you go out to the village. Um, so these are possible uh, meaning behind uh, the requisites. The arms bow, of course, it's, uh, to me, it's a very important symbol of uh, dependent origination because monks and nuns are trained to be dependent on the lay people to beg for food to sustain themselves. And the lay people gain merits by supporting the monastic. So it's a reminder that there's no independent existing self. Okay, so this is a very important uh, to me principle in or teaching in Buddhism or reality of life that there is no independent existing self. This is the anatta. Okay, so when you practice to see that you have to rely on other people and other people rely on you, then you can see that there is no independent existence. And also, I guess, to remind the monks that uh, the word bhikkhu comes from bhikkaka, which is uh, the word for a beggar. So I guess to, for humility. Next slide, please. Okay. I like this a lot. Uh, to me, is um, in life, if we have contentment, we will be much happier people. And monks are trained to have contentment. When we are ordained, we were told that you only need four things to, to live, okay? And actually, you can get it very simply. So monks are told that when you're ordained, that for clothing, we are supposed to look for rags from dead bodies. In the old days, I guess they leave the, the clothing on the dead bodies and they just put it in, into a, a burial ground. And the monks can just take the uh, rags from there and then sew it into a uh, rope. Okay, and we were told that you're supposed to do that, but if someone offer you a uh, cloth or a rope, that is like something extra. It's a privilege. You know? So you can imagine like, you know, every day is a miracle if you know, someone offer you a, a, a ropes, if you get a ropes. And nowadays, monks, you know, we get offered ropes. And similarly for food, we are supposed to take a bowl and go for you know, house to house to, to beg for food. But if someone offers food in a house or in a monastery and so on, that's extra. You know, that's a, a, a special, you can say maybe, you know, it's not stated in the text as miracle, but it's sort of miracle because you are supposed to go house to house. And for shelter, we're supposed to stay under a tree. But if someone invites you to stay in a house, that's, that's you know, extra. That's to me, you know, it's not stated in the text, but it's something like, you know, monks, this is a luxury for you. And for medicine, we're supposed to use cow urine. But if someone offer a, a medicine, then that is something extra. So to me, with this contentment, uh, life much more uh, happier in the sense because you will feel that you always get extra all, all the time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, people ask me, um, what are the differences? What, are, what does the differences in the color of the ropes represent? Okay, actually, not really anything special. Traditionally, the color of the ropes in each monastery depend on the color of the dye that they have. Okay, monks use dye from tree barks, from fruit skin, or whatever that's available at that particular place. But students of the abbot of the monastery usually will continue using the same color. For example, Pa'al Sayado, for some reason, because he used uh, mangosteen skin to dye the ropes, his color is very dark. It's like a, almost, a, it's very, very dark brown. So if you see any monks wearing that robe, only for some reason, only uh, his followers wear this color of robes. You will see it in the slide here, okay? Um, normal, you will see a slide for normal Burmese color, which is a little bit maroon, okay? Then for the uh, other Burmese, they just, uh, that is normal Burmese, but for some reason, Mahasi uh, group, 
the uh, they have a, a light brown color. It's in the slide. Okay. It's maybe because someone in that tradition, one of the main person in that tradition started using this color and the rest just follow. So there's not major significant, but sometimes by looking at the color, you know which monastery group they come from. But it's a bit dif difficult to differentiate between the Mahasi uh, group's brown color and the Thai forest. If you look at it, it's almost similar, but it's different, you can tell. And the city monks, whether it's Thai or Sri Lankan, it's usually very bright color, um, very you know, orangey bright color. So if you see very bright color, usually it's the city monks. And Sri Lankan forest is a bit, uh, also a bit maroonish. So by looking at it roughly, you can tell, but not necessary. And actually there's no big significance behind it. Okay, it's just someone asked me so that it gives you an idea. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what's the Sangha's role in Buddha Sasana? Uh, next slide. The, after the Buddha passed away, because Buddha no longer around, the Sangha Council, they start a Sangha Council, uh, which plays an important role in preserving the Dharma. So immediately after the Buddha passed away, the Sangha convened the first Sangha Council, which is uh, to compile all the teachings. And Arahat Ananda recited the Sutta, Arahat Upali recited the Vinaya, and the rest of the monks listen and check and make sure it's correct. Okay. And one thing to point out here is um, there is a lot of discussions in the first Sangha council regarding minor rules. Because before the Buddha passed away, the Buddha did tell Arahat Ananda that if they some of the minor rules, because uh, actually monks, it's not just 227, there are hundreds, maybe even up to thousands rules, because there are five books. 227 is only the first two books. So anyway, uh, before Buddha passed away, he did tell Arahat Ananda that um, some minor rules monks might not need to follow in the future. But Arahat Ananda never asked, what are they? Okay, And I guess there's a reason behind this. Because if Arahat Ananda asked and Buddha defined what are they, immediately the monks would throw away those rules. So Buddha want to remain flexible, I guess. So in the end, in the Sangha Council, they cannot decide. So they make a uh, agreement that every single rule must be followed. Doesn't matter if it's minor or, or major. So actually, this is my uh, opinion. Actually now, um, not my opinion, sorry. In, in truth, the Theravada Forest Sangha tries to maintain every single rule, okay? You might say that it's arcade, but it has its uh, function. Because once you start, dropping one rule, you will drop another rule, you will drop another rule, then in the end, every rule you will drop because you will say, you know, who is to judge which rule is uh, arcade, which rule is not, okay? So they, there are some rules, for example, people might think it's arcade, like um, fruits, we, have, we need a lay people to uh, do a kapyang, as in you have to take a fork to poke it to say it's allowable because in the old time, during India's time, the Hindu believed that seeds, have life. Although Buddha know that there's no life, but in order to please the community, so Buddha create this rule. So some rules are, you might think it's a bit funny, but uh, the Theravada Forest Sangha, especially when I was staying in, because I, was, I, I learned most of my uh, Vinaya rules in the uh, Pao Forest tradition, they follow every single rules to the, to the detail. And of course, the, uh, the money rule too. Okay, next slide, please. The second and the third Sangha Council were also convened in India to dispel the doubts of the teaching of the Buddha. But in the second council is beginning of the split of two into different sects. Okay, we have many different sects after that. Some sects are died off. Okay, the dispute started regarding on the precepts on money. Some monks started taking money and they felt that it's convenient, it's uh, useful, but some monks don't agree. So there is this uh, split. So there were two third Sangha council because of the split. And then later on, the rest of the Sangha councils are held by, I'm not sure about Mahayana, they might have their Sangha council, but Theravada, fourth Sangha council was in Sri Lanka, fifth and sixth in Myanmar. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what's the importance of the Sangha? Uh, if you look at Mangala Sutta, the Buddha advises to associate with the wise and the Sangha community is a community that seeks wisdom for enlightenment. 
to honor those worthy of honor. And the Sangha community is also you know, on the path to awakening, um, to associate and with monks and nuns, to have religious discussions on due occasions, to help us to get closer to the teaching. Without, uh, okay, the last, yeah. The, again, I want to stress the idea of renunciation is important for us to, so that we don't hold on to our comfort zone. Okay. Again, I want to stress when I talk about renunciation, it's not about giving, a, giving things away. It's about not holding on to our narrow ideas, opinions, and beliefs, and judgments. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, in Upada's Sutta, whenever Ananda said to the Buddha, the, holy the half of the holy life is having admirable friendship, admirable companionship. But the Buddha says, don't say so. You know, don't say that, don't say that, Ananda. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie actually is the whole of the holy life. When a monk has admirable people as friends, companions, and comrades, he can expect to develop and pursue the Noble Eightfold Path. Next slide, please. Okay. And I feel that um, you, it's very important if you want to walk on the path of awakening to actually learn from someone who has realized from the teachings of the Buddha. Okay. Then only we can understand the real meaning of the Buddha. I always share that my rate and your rate and the Buddha's rate might be totally different. So you need someone who has actually awakened to the reality that the Buddha point to so that it can guide you to the reality that the Buddha has seen himself or point to. So you need someone who actually realized the truth to guide you. Okay, We cannot use our ignorant mind to understand the teachings of the Buddha. Okay. Um, when I say you need someone to guide you, it doesn't mean it has to be a monastic sangha. It could be a laity. Okay? Here, I want to use a more a, a wider term of the sangha, as in it could be as, as long as you can get someone who has at least a glimpse of the truth that will help you uh, in the right path, not on the wrong path. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, other things to know about the sangha. Next slide, sorry. Okay, some of you might be aware um, there are different traditions of Sangha, uh, but as long as, doesn't matter whether it's Theravada, Mahayana, or Vajrayana, as long as they are ordained as a monks, we follow the same rules, okay? Follow the same rule doesn't mean that, um, okay, we, we are supposed to follow the same rules. Okay, put it that way. Because I did have a talk with Mahayana monks and I say, how come there are some rules that we do like uh, that you don't follow? Obvious, obvious rule is like not all Mahayana monks, but uh, quite a number of Mahayana monks who eat after, after 12. Okay. Um, so I asked, how come you all can eat after 12? So Mahayana, actually the monk told me supposedly they actually have Bodhisattva vows. Okay. If the, if something, if they feel that whatever, something that they do will help in their bodhisattva wow, but will break the rule, then they say it's okay. The, the higher priority is the bodhisattva wow. Okay, so actually in terms of the rules they should follow is the same. Um, but for Japanese Zen, it's a, most of them are not, they are priests actually, they are not ordained as monks. The Zen masters, a lot of them have wives, have children. They are actually uh, priests. They don't take ordination as a monks, but they, the way they dress or it looks like they are monks because they are actually, in a sense, you can call them priests. In Rajayana, similarly, they have two, two branches. Uh, Rajayana has four sects, four main sects. Okay? The last sect, the Gelug, which is the Dalai Lama sect, are all monks. They take monk ordination. The other three, especially Sakya, uh, most of them are not monks. They get, they have wives, they're married, and so on. But they they wear similar, uh, you can call it robe. So you can't tell, okay? You can't tell which one. I can't tell anyway. They might be able to tell within themselves which one is an ordained monk or not. So some rinpoches are ordained monk, some are not, okay? I think Katju also uh, a lot are ordained, but not all. Ningma definitely many ordained, many not ordained. It's mixed. Sakya is all, 
I can see nearly all unordained and Galoop all ordained. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and people ask me, you know, why there's many different uh, ways to address monks. Okay, so I try to explain from what I understand. Actually, the, the most correct, accurate way, which is what uh, I think Sasananaka Monastery now use, uh, uh, Bande Agachita uh, use, is the word, uh, the term ayasma. Because in the text, if you look at the text, actually, you sh when any formal function, we will address a monk as ayasma so-and-so, ayasma nyaninda, okay? In the Parini, Paha Paribana Sutta, the Buddha laid down the rules that junior monk must address senior monks as Bhante. Bhante actually is a vocative, okay, like you call that. Okay, so I presume it's not in Pali, it's not so correct if you call Bhante Nyaninda. It's like call, uh, maybe let's say your dad name is Amin, it's like dad Amin. Okay, so uh, I guess during Buddha's time they don't do that, but we are so used to it now. I just go with the, to me, you know, I don't want to change the, the it's not disrespectful. So I, I, I don't try to change uh, the people because in Malaysia, we are so used to call Bante so-and-so, Bante so-and-so, okay? But I guess during Buddha's time, they don't use that. And then the term para is 10 years. If there's a para at the back or front, you know, doesn't matter, Maha Terra is 20 years, okay? Um, just a side note, um, sometimes I call myself Nyaninda Bhikkhu. I guess during Buddha's time, they don't do that. They only call Ayasma Nyaninda. Okay? And in Thai, they have their own, uh, what do you call, uh, way, uh, term to use. Uh, normally, they use Ajan. Okay? And very variation, you have Tan Ajan and so on. And that's basically venerable. But uh, when you see someone Ajan something, it means they're ordained in Thai tradition. It could be Malaysian, Westerners or whatever, but ordained in Thai tradition. Luang Po is also Thai tradition, called uh, Venerable Father. Chao Kun, very senior monk. Okay, they have their, Thai have their own title. In Myanmar, usually the word Sayado in use in the old days is the head of the monastery. Like Pao Sayado is head of the Sayado monastery, uh, the Pao monastery. Okay, his, his actual name is Sayado U Achina, but we don't call him uh, that name. Like you don't call it, your father, uh, his name, okay? So we always, we always call the, the name, the, Sayad, the monastery's name, and then Sayadaw. Um, okay. But nowadays, it's quite common to call any monks from Burmese tradition as Sayadaw, okay? The, I guess maybe the standard has dropped or whatever. Now, usually, Burmese, where they see any monks, they'll call Sayadaw, Sayadaw. So, but actually, in the old days, Sayadaw usually is uh, maybe a, uh, respectable monk or a very famous monk. Okay, in Sri Lanka, they have also their own terms. They call uh, a senior monk Hamdru, okay? And someone asked me, what about the term Aya? When you see A-Y-Y-A, normally nowadays it's used by, uh, it's honorable basically, it means by nuns. Okay, whether it's used in the old days, I, I'm not sure. For the Vajrayana tradition, when you see the word Rinpoche, which means the precious one, in the old days, only used for very, very special uh, person, like um, uh, maybe Kamapa, which is, you know, they call them uh, Rinpoche, or someone very, very special. But now again, uh, quite often any, you know, Tibetan monks who are teaching, then you will call them Rinpoche. Okay, next slide, please. If you have any questions, sorry, I'm being rambling on, uh, you can type into the chat. Okay. So what's the significance of wasa for monks and nuns? Wasa, actually, the word means the three months retreat during the rainy season. Because rainy season, difficult to move around. Monks usually wander around. But during the rainy season, we will stay at one place. And after you complete it, it's considered you complete one more wasa. So the number of wasa, actually, is number of years in a sense, indicates um, that the number of wasa is how many you know, years he has become a monk. And seniority is very important in arranging accommodation, lining up for food and either priority. Even if another, I'm more senior than another monk by one hour, I will line up in front and I will get better accommodation, food and so on. Not so much significant in Malaysia because we are very blessed, but in a very poor monastery, it makes a lot of difference whether you get food first or you get food last. Okay, but it's helpful for lay people to know 
to arrange for uh, sitting arrangement and living arrangement. Okay, there's a question someone asked. Uh, is the term Sayadaw only applicable to Burmese monks from Myanmar, Burma? Hence, a Malaysian ordained in Burmese tradition is not called a Sayadaw. No, um, normally, we, any Burmese, they don't care. When they see a monk, they will call, they will call Sayadaw and so and so. Okay? But it's usually used within the Burmese community. It's not reserved to Burmese monk. It's basically re, uh, used for anyone ordained in the Burmese tradition. Okay? So basically, uh, your question is, Anyone. So if I go to Myanmar, usually they will call me uh, uh, Sayadaw Nyaninda. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. This is uh, useful for lay people. When you interact with, uh, because a lot of, sometimes people get very uh, worried, you know, whether I break rules or not, and whether I break karma or not, if I be monk, if a monk. As long as you keep your five, eight precepts, you don't break any precepts even you do something not appropriate to monastic code because it's for the monk and none to follow. It's not for you, okay? As long as you have good intention, you don't create bad karma. The rules are for monks to keep, monks and nuns, and nothing to do with lay people. But of course, having said that, it's nice if you can help the monks to keep their precept, okay? But if you, not intentionally, you accidentally, uh, cause the monks to not keep his precept, it, it, it's not your problem because you, you don't break the rules. Okay, so don't get uh, too worried about this. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is, I feel also very useful. If you are not comfortable with the behavior of some monks, I suggest you don't continue to support them, but try not to have bad thoughts. Don't have this idea that because he or she is a monk or nun, I have to give, uh, serve whatever they need, regardless of how outlandish the demand is. You don't have to. You have a choice. Okay? But also don't hold on to a particular monk. Okay? There's a story uh, Ajahn Brahm told like uh, when he was a new monk, where there was, uh, in, he has in a forest monastery where they really don't get much good food. So one day, a devotee from Bangkok came and they can smell the really aromatic, you know, for once, there's good food coming in. But the, the devotee came and saw that Ajahn Chah wasn't around and took the food and left. He only wants to offer to Ajahn Chah. So to me, it's uh, please don't just offer to a particular monk because you are offering actually to the Sangha of the past, present, future. That way, you have more uh, merits. Um, okay, again, please respectful towards monastic Sangha, but don't treat them as gods or saints. We are also practicing. Okay, not maybe there are some, uh, I guess there must be some monks and nuns who are, who are awakened, but uh, not all of them are. And uh, I say you don't have to fulfill all the requests. If not, not appropriate, it's not bad karma. I just want to mention one incident that I have so that it gives you an idea. Okay, so what happened was. Uh, I was staying at this, me and a few groups of monks. That time I was just ordained, not long. I just was interested in practice. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't know the detail until later. So we were, we were practicing in this uh, small center and it's an empty place. Malaysia is very blessed. We have a lot of uh, empty uh, Buddhist center that can use. So we went there to do our retreat, a group of monks and lay people. We have a, a, a community and borrowed, actually it's a borrowed that place. And the uh, committee was very happy, welcome us, and served us very well, took care of all our food and all that. But on the third day, suddenly the representative of the committee came and told us that, I'm sorry, Bante, uh, we, can't, we can't take care of you anymore. You have to ask your lay people to buy your own uh, food and so on. I was very shocked, but I didn't uh, think more about it because uh, I was just interested to meditate. Only when we left, then I realized what happened. Uh, when we were about to leave, the committee came and apologized to the monks, saying that they have a misunderstanding, okay? Because we allow one of the uh, nuns to uh, take care of the kitchen. And this nun was very demanding. She only tell the, uh, the lay people, you can only serve organic brown rice. And when the banana must be, you know, just ripe, too ripe, she will complain. Not ripe, she will complain. So the lay people thought 
the, this is the representation of the monks, this is the wish of the monks. So they get a bit annoyed and realize, feel that they can't support this kind of monks. So it, it's appropriate to me. Okay, so uh, uh, you don't have to go out of the way. You don't create bad karma as long as you don't have bad intention. Okay, someone has a question. What does Bhante mean by someone who has a glimpse of the truth when mentioning suitable Sangha members to learn the Buddha's teaching from? Um, a glimpse of the truth as in, if possible, the Buddha always advised, of possible, of course, if you can find an arahat to teach you, but difficult, if not, Sakadagami, Anag uh, no, Anagami, Sakadagami, Sotapan. If not Sotapan, at least someone, I feel that has at least some realization. Maybe not Sotapan yet, but at least he can taste the Dharma, a bit of a glimpse of the truth. Okay, how to know that? It's difficult. Yeah, of course. Okay, how to judge? Difficult. But just have this aspiration. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, again, how to interact with a Sangha, please wear decent clothing. For women, please uh, not try not to be alone with a one, one woman and one monk in an enclosed area. Actually, supposedly in Vinaya, you can't even have uh, 10 women and one monk in an enclosed area. Okay, and vice versa for a uh, man and a nun. Okay, um, but there's no rule that a, monk, a woman cannot be a, a, a kapia or attendant to a monk to take care of his allowable requisites. Because monks cannot hold, I mean, there are still monks uh, in the forest tradition who don't keep and hold money, but we are allowed to, uh, uh, we call it allowable requisites, to accept allowable requisites. That means if some lay people, they want to uh, offer some money to an attendant so that the attendant can buy ropes or food when required by the monks, uh, we, we can do that. So the attendant, uh, the lay person would have to tell the monks that I have offered some allowable requisites to so and so. When you need it, please look for that person. So a woman can be uh, can do this role of an attendant or a kapia. Okay. And uh, if you can, please uh, don't offer money in, in any form to monks who, who don't take uh, money so that easier for us. And don't get upset. Okay. Because uh, just, just on the a side story is uh, I know there's a Burmese monk who, who told me that when she was in Singapore, one lady came and offered Ampao and he told, I, I can't accept Ampao. And the uh, old lady complained, is it because it's too little? Okay, anyway, please, uh, uh, it, it, it helps if you know this uh, rule so that you don't, uh, it helps the monks to keep the rule. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned just now, uh, the Vinaya allows the, the lady to pass some money to a kapya and tell the monk that you're offered allowable requisites. If monk needs anything, can ask the kapya. Okay, so this one also, if you see that the monk don't have a kapya, please kindly offer to be the monk's kapya. Quite often, people you know, like they, they don't want to know about it. You, know? you can create merits by helping monks like me to keep our precept. Okay, because otherwise we don't know also what to do. Someone want to offer money and then you know we can't take the money then it will be like you know lost so if someone can offer to be a kapya anyone can do that okay again i want to play a notes please don't judge monks of course nowadays there are many monks who good monks who, who, who don't follow this uh, precept i i they have their own reasons for it so uh don't have bad thoughts i feel okay next slide please okay food uh, just very quickly, please don't offer food afternoon. We can't keep it for the next day. Okay, monks are supposed to relinquish all food. We don't keep food for the following day. When offering food, uh, if possible, especially those, uh, if you're offering monks from the forest tradition, we try to follow the commentary to the Vinaya that when you offer something to food that's to eaten, it has to be within arm's length. If you offer too far away, which most females do, because they are afraid that of uh, contact, which is correct. You, you not, uh, try not to have contact with the monk. But if you offer too far away, not valid for those monks who follow this uh, commentary to the Vinaya. Okay. And also, there's no rules that you cannot offer food from previous meal or uh, leftover from the previous days. So 
in, in during Buddha's time, there are, there are lay people who, while they're eating, they saw monks on arms round. They actually, whatever they haven't finished eating, they, they also offer. But as long as you have good intention, it, it's okay. Okay, because some people have this idea that uh, meal from breakfast I can't re-offer or meal from yesterday I can't offer. No, there's no such rules. Okay, um, but don't put in the monastic in a position to, to need to ask for food. Okay, because not, not so appropriate. Okay, next slide. I think we're finishing. Okay, um, for monks, majority, I think same I'm not sure about Thai, but for the uh, Burmese uh, monastic tradition, when you want to, we often we like to offer the whole table together in uh, Sri Lankan tradition. Um, this one not acceptable for especially monks uh, in the Pao tradition. You, you can offer the whole table provided one person can carry the table. So normally I prefer if you offer plate by plate, okay? You have, a, if probably have an empty table for us to put, and then after you offer me, I will put into the empty table. But of course, um, follow the most senior monks. So if there are other monk, uh, senior monks who, who are other ways, then we follow. Okay, but uh, also no rules that a woman cannot clean a monk's bowl. 